Limited, a video powerhouse that specializes in branding, creative content and marketing services in the region. All right, so he has also won the first Khan's Corporate Media Awards in Singapore. Okay, he's also been nominated as the top 10 best 360 VR companies in Asia and nominated for the SGD Tech Blazer Award as a finalist. Ladies and gentlemen, the perfect person to moderate the whole session, please put your hands together for Mr. Nick Tan, the Managing Director and Founder of Anonymous Production 360 VR Asia. Okay, Mr. Nick, and now I shall leave it to you. Thanks, Des. That was a uh, really great speech, sharing. <laughs> but the real speech comes from Malini. I have to really thank you. Yes, for the once again, true, Nick. Guys, it's a digital media, social media event. You guys are here, you guys are social, right? Would you mind giving another big round of applause to Malini? That would be nice. And also to the three distinguished speakers on stage. All right. So, you guys are going to share just a little bit on data, right? Data. So, why do you guys think? So, I'm just going to ask like a one warm up question before, you know, holding back for the presentation, right? So, why is data analytics today important in your opinion? in the social media space or any context? Yeah. Okay, then I go first. <laughs> oh, Andrew, you want to go first? Okay. So I, I think data-driven decision-making is important uh, because it's the opposite of gut feeling. So if you just think uh, that you, know, you can make decisions based on uh, experience that you had in the past, that may not uh, transcend into what's going to happen in the future. So it's, in my personal view, it's much easier to look at data, something that is heart-based in numbers, and then make predictions out of that. So I think that's where the future lies, and that's why data-driven decision-making is so important. So it's really the opposite of gut feeling and just making wild guesses. Cool. Shahid? You know, uh, the age-old wisdom that people say data is new world is, uh, is based on evidence of the fact that there's an exponential growth of data in the last 10 years. The question is, what do we do about this data? So data provides a new opportunity for us to facilitate an informed decision based on some data points. So I will share with you in a bit the difference between data, information, and insight. So I think um, there's a bit of a preamble. Nice, preamble, guys, preamble. And Raj, Andrew. Uh, I think data-driven, uh, we are actually living in a data-driven world today. Uh, instead of making assumption, thinking that I'm doing the right things, uh, identifying the right data, which is significant to someone's business, I think that's very important in getting the facts right uh, before simply hitting a blank wall. Nice, I can't wait. So, now let's put our hands to Shahid, our first speaker from Berkshire Media. Thank you, Dick. Guys, come on! Still early, lunches in two hours time. Alright, um, this topic is a bit dry, but le let me try to explain in a very entertaining manner. I mean, let's start with the fact that, uh, you know, uh, influencing behaviour is challenging. Why I say it's challenging is, I think Malini put some context in terms of the keywords of positivity, joy, a lot of these anchors on what we call emotion. Now, why? Why do I say that influencing behavior is challenging in this digital world? First point, you guys are fed by 5,000 ads without you realizing it or not, today, in your timeline. Not just from one source, but multiple sources, from Facebook, Instagram, Google Ads, etc. Yeah? And couple that with what you heard from your family, from your WhatsApp group, and your personal experience, your upbringing, your education background, you have at least 30 or more worth uh, years of experience. That kind of um, multiple factors really influence and shape your behavior as a consumer, whether you want to buy a product or not. Now, the easy part is, in this topic, is whether the content is engaging. Yes, you can engage with the content, but it doesn't mean that it influences your behavior to purchase 
or to buy the product today or tomorrow. So these are the topics that I will try to explain briefly without going into much details. Yeah? Now, the question is, engaging content drives and should drive outcome to the business. I came from the, the other side, which is the client side. I understand the meaning of return of investment, etc. So when I jumped in into this advertising world, and this world of social media and digital media, I realized that sometimes we fail to anchor on these three things. Whatever investment that we do, every advertising spend, it has to lead to better conversion, you all know that, or lowering your costs, or to improve reputation. Now with data, you can actually do that now. Right? So I'm just going to refresh bits and pieces uh, for you guys. Like, for example, what constitutes an engaging content? You know all this emotional connection. You talk about, oh, you've got to do human stories. You've got to do things like that and this and that. Relevance, timing. These are all the fundamentals of an engaging content, right? So you measure this user engagement called views, shares, like, comments, etc., click, whatever. But does it lead to the action? Now the question is, how can we as consumers, people who view the ads or engage with the content then convert and influence behavior to the action that you require, whether it's to buy, to purchase, or not buy? And there are many scenarios there. So this is the realm of what we call psychology, neuroscience, neuromarketing, and so forth and so forth. So we use data. Now, fundamentally, if you look at our actions today, 90%, this is not just factual science, yeah? 90% of our actions today are influenced by emotion. Now, people say, what is emotion, what is sentiment? Sentiment is just three, positive, negative, neutral. Emotion is six categories. Um, love, joy, surprise, sadness, fear, anger. So what kind of visual, what kind of content can it actually gives you the emotional impact when you see those ads, when you engage in those content. Because it goes to your primal brain. Anything that you see, whatever video that you watch today, it goes to your primal brain first, before it goes to the rational brain. So you need to attack the primal brain to lead to the, the kind of responses that you want. That's why sometimes misleading ads can actually yield more engagement, the clickbaits, headlines, etc. That's not, that's not ethical at this point in time, but I'm just going to share with you how data analytics can assist. Here's the boring part. Now, if you were to look at analysis, measuring data points upon data points like we all do, capturing and captivating the right audience before you influence them, it makes some sense to actually analyze those data points from multiple sources, not just from your Google Analytics, not just from your impression and reach, it's more than that. You have to couple all the data points into one and make a conclusive decision to move forward, to do the right things. So I'll share with you in a bit. So this is essentially the model that we, 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 we do. It's a three-step approach, analyze, capture, and influence. Yeah? So this is actual data points from uh, 400,000 sample size from social media that talks about different set of emotional triggers and data point based on the client's uh, campaigns, based on issues, based on whatever. So you can actually see the peaks. So I will not elaborate on the peaks, but my point is this. For data scientists who goes deep into this and say, hey, there's a recurring trend here. This ad works better than the other one. So this is in the realm of like the point that you really give up. You go like, shit, how are we going to do this? So, there's a lot of things that we do to help clients. And you can see this kind of really mumbo jumbo data points and you see that from, uh, most of you are familiar with donut charts, right? Sentiment is, ah, this is neutral, this is positive, this is negative. But how about we tell you today, you have 500,000 sample size for a million sample size about your brand. Let's assume you have 20 SKUs, 20 products. And it goes like, how do I even begin to analyze the data? So most people oversimplify this because most of us today rely on technology. We go in, we log in, we open up the dashboard and say, this is it. But the point is there are more beyond the dashboard and the tools and the software that you see today. 
there are more works needs to be done. This is the realm of data analytics. Now, if you look at one topic and you decouple it into smaller topics, then you will see the areas or the priority areas. You can see over there, this whole chart, this donut chart was contributed by five different topics from customer experience, politics, etc., facilities, etc. You will see that, hey, some of these issues or topics are beyond my control. So you don't focus on them, it's as simple as that. So data analytics allows you to prioritize your areas of focus. That's my point. Now, timing, we talk about timing. I said, ah, timing, it's so easy. We just post it between five to seven. What if today, all brands decide to do the same? And you have one little phone and your timeline is really, really, um, goes into this black box and how do you compete in this small real estate space called mobile? So when we, we, we analyze different type of behaviors of different brand, this is one example of a Chinese New Year campaign. Every company deliberately designed their campaign on a different set of timing. From Petronas, CIMB, DG, Maybank, Malaysia Airline. So you engage people at different times. Some people say the optimum time is after your prayers, after your evening prayers, after eight, after nine, because people are at home mostly. What if all the brands decide to congregate and push the ads during their time? So you won't have that attention. So this, the timing is a very important element. It sounds easy, but when you go down deep, it's actually very tough. Now, this is the last slide, yeah? Sometimes we say, okay, let's do that, let's do this, but don't forget to measure your reputation risk. Social media now allows you to measure reputation risk in a simple two by two matrix. For those of you who are not from a risk management background, I can guarantee you, this is the only risk management matrix that's been adopted worldwide based on an enterprise risk management model, ERM. It's probability versus impact. All right, so I'm not going to go into details so you can see over there, this beautiful chart, there's a bit of gray bubble chart that represents the historical movement of this topic called campaigns. So when we club everything together, this campaign contains, it moves around from week to week. There are some weeks is actually red, there are some weeks actually positive, or there are some weeks actually high in terms of impact to your reputation. So this, of, uh, this kind of data is now measurable. So that's the sexy part. So, as a conclusion, since I've got the 15 minutes, data analysis is an ongoing and iterative process. So it's not a one-off. You go and keep on analyzing. And my point is this, never stop analyzing because you will only see the value when you really spend a significant amount of time looking for the piece of information that will help your organization or your task. Thank you very much. Hello, this is really interesting. I mean, do you guys like data? Can I show of hands? This, this, these two guys is like, you know, gurus in data, right? So we were just laughing and like looking at the chart. It's like, oh, this is, this is like, you know, magic beauty. <laughs> in front of, in front of that. <laughs> okay, so let me introduce you the second speaker, Dr. Frank. I will let him do his own introduction and impress you guys with another of his topic on data. Thank you, give a round of applause to him. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I don't have any slides. Uh, I thought, well, I was worried that if I show slides, it would distract from my good looks. Um, so you would, you would look aside. So I preferred not to show any, uh, so you can look at me. Uh, I don't want to do much of an introduction either. Uh, if you want to know more about me, I'm active on LinkedIn. So if you want, uh, just look me up on LinkedIn. That's under my name, Dr. Frank Peter, uh, and then connect there. Don't do it now, don't do it now. Now you have to listen to me and my fellow panel members. Do it later in the next session when Dr. AJ is speaking. Um, uh, so this, this panel session is about uh, data analytics or data science. Uh, and that is something that is very close to my heart. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the brief introduction, um, data is something that helps you to make decisions based on hard numbers uh, rather than gut feelings. So I can speak for hours and hours on this. I actually have a corporate course that goes over three days. So I can speak over three days uh, just about data analytics. 
Uh, but because I've only been given 15 minutes, I'm not going to talk about it at all. I'll talk about something different. Uh, I want to talk a bit more about uh, how to identify which data to look at. Now, if you, if you collect data, let's say your data insights or your Facebook insights, uh, your different platforms have, have different uh, internal rather rudimentary analytics. Uh, if you're active on YouTube, you have a bit more in-depth analytics. If you have your own blog, which I hope you do, uh, then you would have your Google analytics, which gives you tons and tons of data. Now, the issue for most users is they open up the dashboard, they see those data, all those numbers that go up and down and all these things, and you go, whoa, this is cool, but I don't know what to do with it. And then you still, ah, I don't know, so I make my decisions based on gut feeling after all. So the idea really is uh, to put a focus into it. So before you look, or when you look at your numbers, you do this with a particular focus in mind. So that helps you to hone down on what's important in your numbers, in your dashboard, in your reports, and you don't bother about all the other stuff that will distract you. So that's a couple of things I want to point out for that. Now, one is you have to be really, really clear of what your business purpose is before you look at those numbers. Now, if you do social media for, for business purposes, that means you probably want to make money out of this. So I'm going to use this as an example. Now, if your business purpose is to, let's say, make money, then you have that as a focus when you look at those data. And for that, you have to be clear what your business purpose is. And that is not as easy as it may sound. Uh, now, I did recently a corporate training for a group of newspapers. And I asked the newspaper guys, now, what business are you in? What is your business model? And they told me, oh, uh, we show news to people, so we propagate news to the world. And I looked at them and said, no, that's not what you do. So then I got the stares back and said, no, who are you to tell me uh, what our business model is? I've been doing this for 20 years. But that's still not the case. Now, if you think about it, and the same is true for bloggers, anybody who creates content. So if you blog, if you have a newspaper, if you have anything else, who pays the bills or what pays the bills? Who pays the salary in the end of the day? Where does the money come in? When a newspaper posts news, Will those news, the posting of news itself in an online newspaper, for example, will that bring in the money? And it clearly will not. What brings in the money is the advertising revenue for a newspaper. If you're a blogger, you may have a different source of income. So you may have advertising uh, that brings in some revenue. You may have affiliate products, e-commerce. You may use it for lead generation for something else that eventually makes you money. But the driving, for, the, the, uh, yeah, the driving force that eventually pays your salary, pays your rent, pays your other overheads, is the advertising fee that comes in. So your business model for a newspaper is not to disseminate news, it is to make people, uh, to show advertisements to people or to make revenue out of something that, uh, that, that happens on a website. For example, affiliate uh, marketing products or anything else. So the business model is not showing news or showing content. The business model is making ad revenue. And that is something you need to uh, keep in mind when you look at your, uh, uh, your data analytics for content, for example. Let me give you uh, another example as to where this focus lies. Now, we all, uh, probably well, most of us will have followed the uh, presidential elections in the United States, uh, Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. And, uh, that election was to some degree skewed by fake news. Now, uh, there were lots of fake news in the benefit of Donald Trump that came up at that time. Uh, those were disseminated from blogs, from websites, and widely shared amongst uh, Donald Trump followers as real news. And as an example, for, uh, those fake news that culminated in uh, a post or a, web, yeah, a blog post that said, shocking. Pope Francis endorses Donald Trump. That got millions and millions of hits, was shared widely uh, amongst the Trump community, and to some degree may have helped Trump to win the election. Now, some journalists tried to figure out where those posts originated from. And to everybody's surprise, they were not coming out of America. They were also not coming from Russia, for that matter. They were coming all out from a small country called Macedonia. Macedonia, for those who don't know, it's a, indeed a small country, about two million people in the southern part of Europe. It's a remnant of the former uh, Yugoslav Republic. 
So it's a country, small country, beautiful country, by the way. So if you, um, if you look for a, a travel destination in Europe, that's a nice place to go. So you should also look it up. But also, not now, later when AJ speaks. <laughs> uh, so then the reporters figured out who came up with those fake news. And they found it's a group of youngsters out of Macedonia. Uh, so they interviewed those group of youngsters and said, now why did you do this? And they were very, very clear in their focus. They said, we want to make as much money as possible from advertising in our blog. That was their focus, and that's what I was just talking about. They did not care about the election, they did not care about America, they did, they did not care about Donald Trump. All they did was they razor sharply focused on, we want to make as much money as possible from our blog. Donald Trump is a hot topic right now, so we post all kinds of nonsense about Donald Trump. Now, uh, so that, that is an example of how, how sharp that focus should be, uh, also for yours, uh, for, for your content. I don't say you put up fake content or fake news, I mean, that's not the point. But the point is now be very clear in why you do what you do. So once you know that, then you have an easy way of looking at your data. Another thing that you might want to consider also is, and that's my second point, who do you do your content for? Well, for a lot of people, especially for corporates, they try to be liked by everybody. So they come up with content uh, which they disseminate which they hope to get the most possible likes for. Now, likes don't pay staff salaries. Shares don't pay staff salaries. What pays staff salaries in the end is if a blog post, for example, gets traffic back to your website, oh, sorry, if a social media post gets, gets traffic back to your website or to your own blog, where you then can monetize it by either advertising, affiliate products, and so on and so on. So there is no point trying to reach everybody under the sun and being liked by everybody. Because not everybody will come back and give you money one way or the other. Clicking on your advertisements, buying your products, or filling out a lead generation form. So it's quite important to figure out who your perfect target market is before you create that content. And that is also something that data analytics will help you to figure out. So another vision in your report could be to figure out what is your most profitable target market. Not the ones who like you the most. That's not the point. What is the target market that gives you most revenue for your business? So that's, in my eyes, those are two very important points to focus on. First is why do you do what you do? What is your business model? And the business model, as, as I mentioned for the newspaper our example, is not to disseminate news, it is to make ad revenue. So you have to sometimes change your mindset when you look at your own model. And the other one is, think about uh, who is important to you in terms of your viewership. Not the ones who like you, because they may not bring you money, but the ones who will eventually take up an offer on your website, fill out the lead gen form, click on an ad and so on, so bring you some revenue. So when you create content, there's no point trying to reach 50,000 likes that give you no money. My preference would always be, you know, instead of getting 50,000 likes, I'd rather have 100 people or even 20 people, whatever it is, come to my website, fill out my lead gen form and give me some kind of a revenue. So that's also a change in the mindset. It's not a volume game in the end for vanity metrics. It's a game of getting people to your website who are profitable for your own business. So in order to do this, uh, you got to bring out content that will speak to those people. Um, now, the way we do it is uh, we use social media platforms as teasers, but then try to bring people back into our own company, uh, corporate blog. So we use it as a funnel. So the main, uh, the main part of the funnel is really our blog. That is a platform that we own. So there is no limit in terms of how many characters you can use, how big the images can be, and so on and so on. And then we use social media to funnel the traffic into that. So when we do this, for that, so the content itself is written for people who will eventually give us some revenue. And the social media postings are done on platforms where those personas would hang out. So there's again no point if you're, a co if you're a company to post everything everywhere under the sun. There's no point to post on LinkedIn and on Instagram and on Twitter and on and WhatsApp and God knows what. Uh, because the personas that will give you revenue will not hang out on all of those. So you're wasting a lot of time, money and effort. 
So the focus should be to go on platforms that are most profitable to you as well. And that again is another data point that you can easily look up in your own uh, analytics data or on any other platform data. So with this hopefully that it gives you hopefully an idea or a change of mindset in terms of what to look for in, uh, when you look at your data lake and then just focus on those data points that are of importance to your business and to the personas uh, that will bring you your business. In case you disagree, uh, there may be people who disagree. Um, we have an open mic after this, I guess. So I look forward to anybody who uh, wants to challenge us or would like to challenge us. Um, I'm also around later on, so if you would like to discuss it any further, then please do so at any time. Thank you very much. Round of applause again, guys. I hope you guys are having your questions in your head burning and you guys can ask more questions. I have a list here. <laughs> okay, so now we have Andrew Raj. Thanks, Nick. I'm just going to stand here because I have some points. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, you guys are still wide awake. That's good. I'm Andrew from License Media Brad. Uh, we are basically a big data organization. So this is my favorite topic, actually, talking about data analytics, uh, location, behaviorals, and all those kind of things. So that's what we really do for the last seven to eight years: profiling people, identifying the right personas, and putting them into the right buckets, and help the brands to bridge the gap between them and their potential customers. Now, this is how we basically do it. I had seven slides earlier yesterday, and just before we got onto the stage, it became three slides. Now, it's just going to be one slide. <laughs> basically, it tells everything that I'm going to talk about today. So if you look at the slides, you will see certain numbers, and you will see some profiles saying male 42, uh, lives in Kuala Lumpur, retail shopper, coffee lover, Samsung S7. There's a lot more data, actually. But one thing that you don't see there is a name of the person, right? You don't see any names, but you see numerical, you see numbers. That numbers basically represent every unique person, right? So what we basically do in today's world, uh, I'm going to share a bit of, uh, there's too many of industries that we're working on. I'm just going to pick one of it so you can see how you can leverage that in terms of technology and through your customers and brand as well. Let's take about uh, a brand A today, for example. Uh, the most challenging thing in today's world, the most challenging things, for example, if I take a property developers or a car makers, going on a, on a highways, on a billboard, spending quarter of a million dollars on a billboard, hoping that someone who passes by that road is looking at buying a car, hoping that someone who passes by the road is looking at buying a house, hoping that someone who passes by the road is looking at getting a shampoo, Milo, Nestle, name it, any brand. And hoping that if I advertise in a newspaper, someone who buys the newspapers is looking at buying a house. Someone who's buying a newspaper is looking at buying a car. Similarly, sadly, in today's world, the same thing is also happening in social media. We're hoping that someone who is looking at Facebook, mass marketing, is looking at buying a house. Someone in, in Twitter is looking at buying a car. Now, why are we still doing this in today's world when we can actually find out who is looking at buying a car? Who is looking at buying a house? Who is looking at getting something, a household for their families? Who is looking at going to Tesco at 11 o'clock morning? Predictive analysis. So we have historical data, we have real-time data, and we have predictive data. And that's why I like this topic. It's really about data analytics. Now, uh, for example, uh, this may sound scary, but some of you all probably already know. If, let's say, we run a heat map in this hall today from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock, for example, uh, at the end of the day, at 5 o'clock, my system or the platform which is already available out there can actually tell how many people is in this building right now, this hall right now, and how many devices is being paired to use each unique person. And when you leave at five o'clock later, we can even tell the age, the gender, 
Where were you before this? Where were you most likely going to go after this? This is what we call the real data in today's world. And this is how we really go on and help those brands out there to bridge the gap, identify, find out the right audience and serve your ad. And the other thing is that, for example, let's say I put something on the billboard and, uh, or something on the, on the radio, TV, ads, anywhere. Um, at the end of the month, the chief finance officer, CFO or CEO is going to come to the marketing head, CMOs. I am sure there's a lot of CMOs here uh, to come back to you guys and say, for example, let's say you took a million dollar last quarter, so what happens with the money? So what sort of data are we going to give the C CFO or CEO? Are we going to tell them that, yeah, we had about 1,000 cars passes by the billboard? Are we going to say that, yeah, we managed to get 100,000 likes? So how are you going to correlate that to your actual sales or revenue in a real life? That's what matters the most. Not knowing how many likes, how many people actually clicked on my ad, I always tell my customers, we, we are not here to help to drive the number of clicks. We are not here to help to drive the number of likes. But we are here to help to drive the real visit, which is the offline pattern. Now, having this offline attributes is then where we go to the online attributes and we use and leverage social media targeting the right people. Okay, now one thing is, we have managed to identify this set of people who's looking at buying certain things, right? Now, how do we engage them or how do we reach them is through social media, right? The next thing is, uh, let's talk about the after, the after, all right? For example, um, let's take a brand Toyota, for example. This is Toyota today. Is anyone from Toyota here today? I hope not. Okay. <laughs> Let's just take Toyota for example today, running a campaign or they, they launch a new VR or something like that and uh, then they run a, a billboard campaign, they run a, a Facebook campaign and then they run a TV ad campaign, whichever campaign that can be. So, but if you are running your ad programmatically based on location attribute, doing your data analytic correctly, at the end of the day, you will know because of your ads how many people actually visited your showroom. You can even target your competitors. For example, let's say you want to go to Ford or Mazda and tell them uh, and, and do some Joe fencing or something, and you want to find out people who go to your competitors, people who go to Ford should see Toyota's ad, people who go to Mazda should see Toyota's ad, people who go to Simdabi should see Massing's ad. Does that help? Why, why are we really doing this is because when someone walks into a Ford showroom, most likely he's looking at buying a car, right? But if I search something online, if I search something online, it could be vendor shoppings, maybe something that I'm going to buy a year down the road. Maybe, for example, my wife is looking at buying a house next year. She's already online right now checking out which is the best place, what the prices looks like. But she's not going to buy a house right now. But how do I know who's looking at buying a house right now? What if we can geofence the entire competitors? For example, let's say, uh, let's just take Gamuda, for example. That's, those are top giants of property developers in Malaysia. And let's just say IJM, let's just say Simda Bees. And we geofence a certain places of these competitors and find out in real life who is actually walking into that showroom. Identify these people. The moment we know that, then we know who is looking at buying a house, who is not doing a window shopping on the net, but who is seriously looking at buying a house. I will not spend a time uh, on the road paying petrol or my time to drive long way to go to a showroom if I don't have a need. I'll do it online. I'll do my research online. But if I'm really looking at buying a house, I want to see how my bathroom looks like, my kitchen looks like, my dining tables, all those places. I want to feel it before I buy it. That's the real offline attributes. That's where the real transaction happens. But when you have all these offline attributes, you need to use your online attributes. You need to use your social media to tap that people. For example, if I am looking at buying a car, find a way to reach me in social media. First, find out whether I'm looking at buying a car. Don't send me a message. I'm gonna share something. Um, this is the real thing, real life things that's happening today. 
how many of you all, when you watch a YouTube video, you come across an advertisement. You'll come across an advertisement. My fingers goes right button to skip an ad after four seconds. Do you guys do that? Yes. Why are we doing that? Because the ads that we are seeing is not relevant to us. No one is doing a data study. There's no analytics being done. An ad is just being pushed to all of us. It's mass marketing. I want to see an ad which is relevant to me. If I'm looking at buying a car, I should see a Toyota ad. I should see a Ford ad. Why am I seeing a McDonald's ad? It doesn't make sense. So that's how we can actually leverage in today's data and analytics to make sure that we are serving the ads to the right people and the people is seeing the right ads which is relevant to them so they can take an action after seeing that ad. That's what's the most important thing. Not number of impressions of, not number of clicks, not number of likes, but the actual visit, the actual offline attributes that happens in your real place, in your real life. That what matters the most. Um, I guess uh, I have actually a lot more to share, but we'll have a lot more uh, time later to maybe perhaps to, to, go, to go through. Again, thank you very much, guys. Can we just give all three speakers a round of applause again? Sorry, guys, I'd like to make you guys clap because it keeps everyone awake. <laughs> Okay, I find the three different speakers have a very unique proposition on data. Like um, early on, Andrew mentioned a, um, a little bit on how you leverage, right, on offline data and you know real-time primitive data. And we have Shahid talking about sentiment, right? Sentiment and emotions that trigger, you know, the kind of a response and actions. And we have Dr. Frank talking about focus. I like that. You talk about focus, you talk about you know, the business model and you know, looking into the right platform. So let me direct the question to you first. How? Before I start this question, can I just ask the, the crowd here, how many of you guys are entrepreneurs and SME owners? Okay. How many of you guys are marketers? And how about the rest? Sales? Any, the rest, social media? Who wouldn't put up the hand even if, uh, no matter what question has been asked? That means they're all, they're like us, you know, they do everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those who don't raise their hands, uh, we, I already got an answer, that means you do everything. High five, do everything well. So, Frank. How often do you come across like, you know, SME owners actually understand that they need to really focus on their business and look deep into the business model before they engage on data? All the time. So that, uh, I'd say 100 out of 100. Uh, quite often the, the perception is that, um, uh, we are, it doesn't matter what it is, no, it's, it's banking, it's retail, uh, people think now we have a product, we want to sell the product to somebody. No. I have a product, somebody will come and buy it. And that's often not the case. So you have, to, you have to reverse engineer, you have to see what your customers want, and then you create a product to solve that need. Uh, so that's the design thinking part. Uh, so most of the time when I, when I, when I uh, consult with companies or go for training with companies, they already have existing products and they're looking for customers for those particular products, be it through online marketing, be it through advertising, or offline marketing as well. And um, quite often this is doomed from that moment onwards because quite often those products are, are there but there is no market for it. So part of uh, the stuff that we do, when we, especially when we look into uh, digital marketing or digital transformation is to go the other way around. So we look at where there are needs, what customers want based on the data that we collect and then we try to generate a product that will solve that need or that requirement that the customers have. And that is all data driven. So you gotta ask your customers, you have to collect the data, whether it is online data, whether it is offline data, but those data will help you to make decisions as to what products uh, should be pushed, what products should be retired, and so on. Shahid, how about you? Like, you talk about data, you talk about information, insights, right? I mean, to, I'm not sure about you guys, but to a lot of marketers, business owners, salespeople, this sounds fluffy. So, 
what do you have to say to that? Okay, uh, let me try to explain this uh, three keywords, right? Data, information, and insight. Data are those raw data that you see from the Excel sheet level, information that you see from the dashboard, right? Information is processed into charts and graphs. So whatever that you see in your dashboard or whatever they see in terms of graph, line graph, bar charts, these are all information. It's already been processed. Now from data to information, there's another layer in the middle which is data clean that people do not see. Now today, if you look at whatever that you see from Google Analytics, from your dashboard, you take it as a gospel truth, right? You do not challenge the, the, the amount of information or data that, that was used to produce those charts. So most decision makers out there take, it all, take all these charts together and call it information and pass it to your managers and superiors and your directors and your president and say, look, things are all right, the sales is doing fine, there's a correlation here. But correlation could be causation. You do not go deep down and analyze and debunk some of these data points. Where does it come from? The data source. For example, you have a bunch of online behaviors versus the offline behaviors. Does it correlate to each other? And things like that. Now, insights is derived from those kind of information. When you do a deep dive analysis and couple with your historical data, couple with your experience, that's what we call insights. And it needs to have recommendation. It needs to have an assumption. It needs to put, you need to put some caveats around your findings. That's just what we call insights. Because there's no artificial intelligence that can auto-generate insights for you. Although there's a lot of claims out there, oh, action about insights, just click of a button. Because you guys, some of you guys were born in the 1990s or 1980s. For people like me and the rest of the people here, they were born in the 1970s or even 60s. Ouch. Ouch, yes. So, oh God, I don't look like that, but anyway. Uh, when, when we, so, that's insights. Now, there's another layer after insight, which is called actionable insight, which is even harder to find. It's like finding uh, what we call a, a goal, uh, I mean, in a, in, in a huge landmine. No, it, it's not easy. Because this actionable insight, one tweak of a button, one decision can change either your sales, can improve your sales tremendously, can cut costs down by 30%, and things like that. This is what we call actionable insight. From, at least from a corporate standpoint, when you look at how your CFOs, your CMOs, and your CEO think, that's what you're looking at, that aha moment. So going back, you'll spend maybe six months or even a year looking at this data to the point of analysis paralysis, the actionable insights is only that five to 10% of whatever you found from this bunch of mumbo jumbo data. I think that kind of summarizes nice. the information. Yeah? How about Andrew? Like, do you think that it takes like, you know, a huge, like a sophisticated system, a team, you know, to really start something? Because, you know, I, I know you guys, some of you guys are from like MNCs, but many are from SME. And in, in fact, the whole business enterprise world, 95% are SMEs, right? So like, how do you get started? I mean, I'll start with Andrew. Like, you know, how can people really get access to this thing and, you know, actually know how to use it or start doing this? That's a very good one, actually. Um, a lot of MNCs out there, they spend tons of money on this kind of things, uh, trying to develop, uh, which I would say don't do that. Don't ever try to develop, start something new, re-engineer, which is something already there. So it's the best thing to do is there's a lot of people who is doing it out there. Leverage. Leverage what is already available. This platform, some of them are free, some of them are being charged. But it's already available and is being done, tested for years after years after years. So instead of re-engineering, putting in money and starting your own platform, and that's going to cost you millions and millions of dollars. Don't ever do that, but instead leverage on what's already available and learn from the experts. That's the best thing to do, I would say. Nice. How about a crowd down here? Can I have some questions on the ground? Anyone want to ask some questions to this panel of experts? Lady over there in the front row. Um, mic please guys, thank you. Come in, come in. The, the mic. In future there will be drones, you know, shipping the mic over. 
Okay, uh, hi guys. Um, my, my general question is kind of post-analysis, right? You know, after you've gone through all of that and after you've collected all this data on, on your consumers, on your focus group, whatever, uh, what are some of the ways that a company can actually act on that data? So, you know, for example, uh, Frank, you mentioned, um, what was it? You actually mentioned using that to, to look at your business model to reframe that, right? So kind of what, like what methods or, or what processes can you put in place with that data that you've collected? So a good point was was pointed out. Data is just a collection of of points. So it's it's also sometimes referred to as a data lake. So it's not structured. So you need to find some kind of a platform that will help you to structure those data. Uh, in the old days, it was what could have been done with an Excel spreadsheet, but it's just too complicated for that. So free platforms. Let's say if you look at web analytics, uh, free platforms are available. For example, as Google Analytics, um, that will do all the heavy lifting for you. Um, then once you have your, uh, your focus set in terms of what I tried to allude to earlier, uh, in terms of what your business model is, what your, what your customer personas are, then you can look at, uh, at the reports based on the data points in, for example, Google Analytics and then make informed decisions based on that. So as an example, let's say you write uh, blog posts. You have like 10 different blog posts in, in one sequence. One blog post, or they're all, let's say they're all about the same theme. Yeah, as, a, as an example. One blog post has higher video content in it, one blog post is short form, one blog post is long form, one has lots of images in it, and so on and so on. But in terms of the business purpose of the post, they're all the same. Then you could look at your reports and see, what's the, first of all, what's the engagement rate? If you have a long form blog post, uh, let's say something that has whatever 1,500 words in it, you would estimate that somebody takes 10 minutes to read it. If they only spend 20 seconds in it, then that particular uh, long form blog post is too boring. So then you might need to revamp it. So that is just one thing when it comes to the engagement. The other thing is, uh, and to me that's more important, do these blog posts actually lead to some action um, that you need for your business purposes? So meaning, if somebody actually goes through the thousand words or thousand five hundred words, or watches the video or looks at all the images, do they follow through and end up at whatever thank you page you may have on your website? That will then give you an indication not how not only how popular that particular post is, but also how well it helps you in getting the full customer cycle to an end. So an endpoint would be what's called technically a thank you page. So let's say you do an e-commerce transaction, you put stuff in a shopping cart, you uh, put in shipping info, payment info, and you end up at a page that says thank you for your purchase. If you have a lead generation form on your website, that is the same thing. So people fill it out, click a submit button, end up at a page that says thank you for uh, subscribing or whatever it is. So that is the end point. So that is a measurable data point uh, that you can then uh, evaluate in response to the type of blog post that you have, uh, in terms of content what you have in there, uh, in terms of words to have in there, of length, and so on and so on. Did that kind of address what you were asking? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I basically just wanted to have an idea, like those examples basically, of how a company could be able to like use that post-analysis data to, to kind of uh, act, be actioned on, I guess. So thank you. So ma'am, can you just um, tell us your name and where you're from? Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Christine and I'm actually from BFM. So the rest of you guys, um, please uh, just introduce yourself so you know, we are all aware, the panel is aware. And the, the guy up there behind, at the last row, Keep the questions coming. Hi guys, uh, this is Daksh. I run a digital agency called iFord. We've been uh, working with a lot of brands for nine years now. Uh, so quick question for all the panelists. This is more of a conversation. Uh, while data is fueled to the industry, you know, too much of data can be confusing. There is uh, you know, Google Analytics, there is Facebook Insights, there are third party tools, there are free tools. So as a small business owner, and I'm sure there are a lot of you know, small business owners, what is the actionable data in terms of metric that you should look at when it comes to social media engagement? This is not about transactions, this is not about the e-commerce side, but when you probably focus on the social media channels where you know Facebook is dying, Twitter is not used in a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, clients as well. So what actually they should be looking at? Um, I'll try to understand the question, but uh, essentially um, if you look at matrices, the key matrices for Facebook, Google Analytics is just boxed down to a couple of things here. Yeah? Let's go back to basics. Let's try to declutter all these matrices. Uh, some people call it vanity matrices. So essentially the actual um, matrices that leads to the actual behavior or action by consumers, either online or offline, is number one is the page visitors, right? You can't run away with that. 
Now, number two is, of course, the, uh, the amount of time that is spent on your website. So Google Analytics can tell you all the behavioral from one page to another and how much time was spent on each of those pages. That's number one. From Facebook, it's very simple. It's the number of clicks because you need to push Facebook to drive visitors to your website if that's the end goal. But for SME, your end goal will be your landing page, which, IE, which, uh, which is your website. With, uh, I presume there is a, some kind of e-commerce capability there as well. So if you look at generally, at the aggregated level, only 30% of users out there actually search for that particular keyword. So maybe 30% comes from Google search. 70% comes from other channels. And guess what? The 70% of the page visitors comes from predominantly Facebook. So what, what does it tell you? Number one, the takeaway is you need to push content. Pushing content is better than pull content. You only pull, you only search when you have the desire to buy or to know more about the product, right? So you then search. That's only one third, thirty percent. So the question is, as an SME owner, for example, where do I need to spend my time on? It's on pushing out the content. But again, there is that uh, little caveat there, which is called you need to spend more. And if you look at Facebook and Google cost per click, it's climbing up. So if you want to push your product into a particular country, for example, in Singapore or Malaysia, it's highly saturated, so your cost per click gets higher and higher. And Facebook knows that. So it encourages you to spend more as you get more clicks and drive more visitors to the website. Can you imagine the cost per click now, compared to the last five years, has increased by 65% on Facebook alone. So there's a huge increase. So last time you're probably spending 0.03 cent per like or per, per click. Now it goes up to, I don't know, 40 cents, 50 cents, you see? So I hope it answers some of the questions for the SME owners out there. Any questions on the right side? Up, uh, gentleman on blue at the second, third row. Hi, good morning to everyone. My name is Vishal, you can call me Vish. Um, I have a question from two perspectives, and this is a little, maybe a little off topic. It's about GDPR. Um, what is your view from a tech standpoint? Is it going to skew data when people are more responsible for how they want to share the data and what kind of data they want to share? And so the one side is the technical side of how that's going to help or transform the way business is done. The second is from a policy standpoint. Where do you guys sit on um, this, this direction that uh, I think if you see these days, Apple is advertising Apple privacy, um, other Android platforms are giving users permission for how they want to share their data, so on and so forth. So I just want to understand if you could share maybe both perspectives, the tech side, as well as maybe from a personal standpoint, how do you feel about that? I think I'll take the first part of that in terms of uh, data sharing, I guess you were talking about. Um, compared to uh, 10 years ago versus what's happening today, people are very careful in sharing their information. I think uh, Ms. Malini made a very good point today addressing actual, the actual question that you have actually in terms of uh, what sort of data is being shared and uh, how reliable the data could be or how much is people sharing today. I guess people are sharing as much as they want to see. I will not be sharing more than what I don't want to see, right? For example, uh, if I need to make some purchases, right? I will not be shouting too loud on the social media compared to how it was prior to this. Now, everything that you put in social media becomes so viral. Everyone that retweet, resend, all those kind of things happen. So today, people are very careful in, in what they are sharing or what information they're giving away. But to a certain extent, I, I think it's still reliable, but depends on what we are looking at out of that data. What we're really looking at out of the data. I mean, sharing is one thing, but what we are looking at out of that information that people are sharing. Is it something that we are looking at? Is it something that has to do to my business? Is it relevant to me? Can I leverage those data? It's really depending on us as well at the end of the day. Uh, lots of information is being flooded across every social media, be it Facebook. Uh, my, my guru always used to tell me, rubbish in, rubbish out. 
right? So there's a lot of information available there, but it's, I guess, again, how we can leverage uh, the platforms we, like I was sharing just now, uh, to really identify those information. Is it relevant to us? Is it really something that we can leverage on? I think uh, we can always leverage another, to another tools or platform to, to analyze those kind of things. This one, uh, the second one? What was the second one again? It was more of a personal uh, standpoint on where you think the GDPR, uh, the GDPR is, is going to us. Um, so this is, this is just a personal opinion. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, there's a... Anybody does not know what GDPR stands for? GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. That's a European regulation um, to protect your own your online privacy, basically. Uh, so that companies are no longer allowed to collect uh, your personal data, even anonymized, without your consent. Um, so let's... Malaysia has quite stringent, stringent rules as well. Not quite as stringent as the European ones, but uh, they still exist. Now, uh, the funny thing is that if you, um, if you do a survey, or that has been done, uh, a survey amongst European customers, everybody in that survey, or most people, want to have personalized messages, personalized advertising but nobody is willing to share personal information. So that's, called, that's the GDPR paradox. Um, so they're, they're, they're want, but they're not willing to share their information so they can actually get it. Uh, it's, it's a very important question. Uh, I, I really have no, no way of answering it. Uh, from a personal point of view, I also like to do anonymous browsing. I use Opera browser with a VPN built in uh, in order not to share my personal information. Uh, on the other hand, I do also appreciate uh, personalized messages that I get uh, through advertising. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. From a um, data scientist point of view, it's, an, it's, a, it's a nightmare uh, because it is very, very difficult to analyze data uh, that are either not true. Like, let's, say all, let's say if all of you were to use VPNs, virtual private networks, and access my website, then you all would not be shown coming out of Malaysia, for example, but coming from the US, the UK, God knows where. So for me, it's going to be very, very difficult to make decisions in terms of my content because it looks like you're coming from all over the world rather than from Malaysia. Um, is there a way around it? I'm not sure. Uh, so that's, it's really guesswork. Your guess is probably better than mine in, in this regard. Uh, but it, it's a nightmare for data scientists that I can clearly tell. Can I have just one last question since um, yeah, we have much time left? So gentlemen standing there in the middle. Good morning, my name is uh, Pragalat. I'm uh, from uh, The Leaders Online. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Frank Peters. With regards to news, these days people are saturated with an overload of information. <coughs> so, uh, besides politics, what are the new trends are we looking at? What kind of information and new uh, fields in news are the masses looking for? This is a really good question. I wish I could answer that question. Uh, if I would know, I wouldn't tell you because I would probably develop a platform and become an instant millionaire out of that. Exactly. <laughs> but um, no, one, one thing that, uh, that becomes more and more important is uh, online learning. So, the, so I'm in a training field. Um, I'm, I'm a corporate trainer. And I'll, I'll see that uh, many people use the internet to learn. And it is not learning as in like two-day courses, three-day courses. It is really bits and pieces, piecemeal. So uh, I want to know something very specific. So I look for a YouTube video, five minutes, ten minutes, just to learn that particular subject. So I think that is that is a major part of what the internet, or in terms of in terms of content consumption, uh, is paid for. Especially YouTube. So I guess half of YouTube is for that. The other half of YouTube is. Uh, probably entertainment. So I would, I would say both those two, 50-50, give or take. Uh, I don't have any hard numbers for this. 50% uh, entertainment, 50% educational content. That I would see uh, is uh, probably the major trend that goes on. Anyone want to add on? Yeah. All right, time's up. Thank you for your participation, your questions. I like the crowd. Can you give them a, another big round of applause? I hope you guys learned something. I learned a lot, definitely, and I'm a practitioner of that, and I definitely want to learn more from you guys. You guys can always, you know, approach them after this session and ask them questions right behind. Thank you. All right. So once again, let's put our hands together for Mr. Nick Tan, our moderator.
Mr. Shahid Shaya, Dr. Frank Peter and Mr. Andrew Rajkanan for an amazing and of course, selfie.